Welcome to Dr. Mercola's Cellular Wisdom, the show where we shine a magnifying glass on the tiny building blocks of our bodies, because it's the small stuff that can make or break your health. I'm Ethan Foster, the type of guy who's more comfortable discussing stock prices than sperm quality. But I'm here anyway, and you're stuck with me. And I'm Alara Sky. I've been known to crack a joke or two about intestinal flora while simultaneously dishing out a surprising amount of biological insight. Today, we're diving into a topic so microscopic you might wonder how it could cause big problems. But trust us, it does. For those just tuning in, this is the podcast that pairs my calm, observational style with Ilara's comedic wit. We toss in a dash of science, courtesy of Dr. Mercola's ongoing mission to uncover how our cells work and why they sometimes stage a revolt. A revolt is exactly right. Today's drama involves microplastics, those charming plastic particles under 5 millimeters in size. You know, the ones we keep hearing about in the ocean, in fish, in Arctic snow, and apparently in the air we breathe. Next thing you know, we'll be calling them our new neighbors. With neighbors like that, who needs junk mail? In 2019, around 460 million tons of plastics were produced, which is interesting because I recall producing zero. Yet, I'm somehow dealing with the consequences. Right? Classic group project scenario, we do none of the work and all of the cleanup. And by cleanup, I mean we're inadvertently inhaling and ingesting it. Let's start with a quick primer. Microplastics can be primary, made intentionally small, like those old microbeads in face scrubs or secondary, forming when larger plastic items break down into countless little shards. Funny how humanity put microbeads in face scrubs, as if rubbing plastic grit on our faces would produce a youthful glow. Turns out it might be more of a plastic sheen, and not in a good way. Now, let's address how these microplastics end up airborne. Think of plastic water bottles left in the sun or synthetic fabrics in your washing machine, shedding fibers that swirl around your living room like uninvited confetti. And you can't even vacuum them all up. They're small enough to travel on a breeze straight into our lungs. That's a real conversation starter. Hey, what's new? Not much, just finishing a deep breath of plastic particles. Wanna join? I think I'll pass on that invitation. It's like we're living in a world where confetti never stops, but the party ended a long time ago. So what do these airborne microplastics do to our health? I read that the University of California, San Francisco, looked at existing research and concluded microplastics harm our digestion reproductive system, and respiratory system. Basically, they hit us anywhere they can. These researchers say microplastics cause chronic inflammation, immune suppression, and issues with sperm quality. Think about that next time you're unwrapping a plastic-wrapped sandwich. It's a big reason they suspect actual health impacts are likely underestimated. If we can only measure certain angles, like sperm counts or lung trouble, who knows what else is happening on the microscopic level? Maybe next week we'll find out microplastics hamper our ability to recite the alphabet backwards. I couldn't do that even before microplastics, so I'm not sure I can blame them for everything. But the infiltration into newborns is a new level of startling. The fact that microplastics have shown up in human placentas and even in meconium, those first baby poops, says it all. It's like a bizarre welcome gift. Hello, newborn life. Here's a wad of microplastics to keep you company. Clearly, these plastic bits can travel. If they can navigate the female body and the placenta, it's time we rethink how easily these guys slip through our defenses. Speaking of defenses, let's talk lungs. The respiratory tract is designed to filter out all sorts of intruders, but microplastics can bypass those lines of defense. They irritate the lining, leading to inflammation, breathing troubles, even conditions like asthma. They're also Trojan horses for other pollutants. They carry around heavy metals or persistent organic pollutants, delivering them deeper into the lungs. So it's like you get a combo deal. Buy one microplastic, get a side of chemicals free. Wonderful. Exactly what everyone wants. Let's not forget the constant introduction of microplastics in indoor environments. Lint from clothes, dust from carpets, packaging. Every time we take a breath, we might be getting a bonus side of microplastics. It's enough to make me consider living in a giant plastic bubble, though that might be ironically self-defeating, come to think of it. I'm picturing you inside a bubble, telling jokes about microplastics floating around you. But let's shift to the digestive piece, because apparently we can't just breathe microplastics, we also love to dine on them, albeit involuntarily. Right. The gut microbiota, that bustling community inside our intestines, is not a fan of these plastic strangers. Microplastics can inflame the gut lining, contributing to leaky gut syndrome. Then toxins slip into the bloodstream, turning our bodies into a battleground for chronic inflammation. I always thought the gut barrier was more robust, but apparently it's like a picket fence that can develop holes if we throw enough plastic at it. Then the entire body has to deal with the fallout. Things like IBS or inflammatory bowel disease become more likely. Even mental health can get roped into this because of the gut-brain axis. If the gut's in turmoil, the brain feels the pressure. We're talking potential neurological effects, depression, anxiety. It's the real puppet show, 
microplastics pulling the strings. A puppet show none of us signed up for. The more I learn, the more I realize these are not just random specs. There's a real possibility they affect metabolism, immune response, fertility, mental health, and more. It's like microplastics are the world's worst wedding crashers, and the wedding is your body's internal harmony. And that's the second time this episode we've brought up an uninvited guest metaphor. Maybe we need a bigger bouncer at our bodily gates. Absolutely. So let's pivot to how microplastics impact fertility. According to recent findings, they can interfere with hormone production and function. They end up in testicular tissue, reducing testosterone levels and sperm quality. Meanwhile, in women, microplastics have been found in the ovaries. It's an equal opportunity crisis. We've got a generation whose fertility is declining, and microplastics may be a huge player. When microplastics creep into the womb or show up in placentas, that's a neon sign that says something has gone off the rails. Animal studies even found it leads to metabolic issues in offspring. So it's not just us we're messing with. It's our future kids. We have enough to worry about raising kids in the modern world without also handing them a brand new set of microplastic-laden health risks. So how do we lower our exposure? It's not as simple as going to a magical plastic vacuum store, but we can dial down daily plastic usage. Reusable cloth or canvas bags instead of single-use plastic bags. Always a good start. I admit I have about 19 cloth bags in my trunk, so at least I'm not single-handedly distributing thousands of plastic bags across the planet. But it feels like a drop in the ocean compared to 460 million tons of global production. True, but we take the steps we can, right? Minimizing single-use plastics, like switching to stainless steel or glass water bottles, lessens the demand for new plastic to be churned out. And let's not forget your lunch containers. Maybe skip the plastic wrap and opt for beeswax or silicone covers. I've seen those beeswax wraps. They look like they belong in a medieval apothecary. But hey, if it helps, I'm game. Another thing, wearing more natural fibers, cotton, wool, linen, reduces shedding of synthetic microfibers in the wash. Those synthetic fibers can head straight into waterways. Or swirl around your dryer as that suspicious lint you might find wrapped around your socks. And as far as indoor air goes, Frequent cleaning, good ventilation, and perhaps an air purifier can help. Nothing fancy. Just keep your home from being a microplastic jungle. Now, there's another angle here. Plastic is also a known xenoestrogen, meaning it mimics estrogen in our bodies. So if you're loaded with xenoestrogens, you can end up estrogen dominant, which triggers a bunch of unwelcome side effects. That's where Dr. Mercola likes to mention progesterone. Progesterone is the natural antagonist to estrogen, helping maintain balance. A lot of folks might benefit from it especially if they're wrestling with hormone imbalance. But there's a catch. He has strong opinions on how it should be administered. He advises what's called transmucosal progesterone, applying it to your gums for absorption, rather than transdermal application on the skin. The reasoning is that the skin has high levels of an enzyme that can convert progesterone into other substances, so you don't get the intended benefits. Sounds like biology's version of a detour sign. You think you're going to the anti-estrogen highway, and then you end up in the scenic route of allopregnanolone. So Dr. Mercola says it's best to apply progesterone to the gums for direct absorption. Of course, people might raise eyebrows at the notion of applying hormone cream in your mouth, but that's how you maximize the benefits. He also points out that vitamin E is the best solvent for progesterone. And watch out for synthetic vitamin E. It has to be the natural form, labeled D-alpha-tocopherol, not D-L-alpha-tocopherol acetate. The man is thorough. The logic is that vitamin E not only stabilizes progesterone, but also helps shield you from the damage of linoleic acid. So if you're in the market for a do-it-yourself approach, he mentions you can buy pharmaceutical-grade progesterone powder and measure it out with tiny spoons, like you're about to conjure up a magic potion. According to his method, 25 to 50 milligrams is a typical dose, usually taken about half an hour before bed, because progesterone can ease you into a good night's rest by boosting GABA levels and lowering cortisol. That's reason enough for me. Sleep is precious. But it's also recommended that menstruating women time their progesterone use with their cycle. So the luteal phase, or last half, is the standard window, starting 10 days after the first day of your period until your next cycle begins. And if you're a non-menstruating woman or a man, the suggestion is to use it daily for four to six months, then take a one-week break. Obviously, if you've got complex questions, a knowledgeable professional can guide you. But the essence is that progesterone, used the right way, counterbalances excess estrogen that might be fueled by microplastics and other environmental sources. Yes, it's a mouthful, figuratively and literally. But let's keep in mind that none of this is a free pass to keep using plastic like there's no tomorrow. Even if you add progesterone, you still want to reduce the plastic footprint that started the hormone imbalance. Exactly, because we can't just pop a supplement or smear something on our gums and keep ignoring the big picture. 
This is about making lifestyle changes that limit microplastic exposure, phasing out plastic containers, avoiding single-use plastic, choosing natural fibers, ensuring better indoor air quality. And if we don't make those changes, we'll keep dealing with sneaky irritations in the lungs, chaos in the gut, potential fertility issues, and who knows what else. Transmucosal progesterone might help keep your hormones more balanced, but it can't single-handedly fix an entire microplastic-laden environment. It's like trying to dehumidify the air while leaving the faucet running non-stop. You might get some relief, but the root problem is still causing a flood. Microplastics are in everything from grocery bags to clothing to that handy-dandy plastic wrap you're using for leftovers. And let's not forget, we're not just stalling for our own sake. We share this world with future generations and every other living creature. There's an entire ecosystem out there that also pays the price for plastic debris. When you see pictures of sea turtles choking on plastic, that's not a random fluke. It's a reflection of our daily habits. Agreed. So let's wrap up with some highlights. Number one, microplastics are everywhere. Air, water, even baby's first diaper. Number two, they can inflame lungs, disrupt digestion, and meddle with reproduction. Number three, practical solutions include cutting down on plastic use, opting for natural fibers, cleaning indoor air, and storing food without plastic. Number four, a complementary solution to the hormone havoc is balancing out estrogen with progesterone, specifically a transmucosal approach. It's a solution Dr. Mercola and others talk about as a way to counteract the estrogen-mimicking nature of plastics, but none of these strategies negate the need to address the actual plastic production itself. So the moral of the story is, let's treat plastic like a rowdy tenant we're finally ready to evict, rather than a friend we invite to stay another year. We need to reclaim our environment and our own bodies from the plastic infiltration. I love that analogy. We're raising the rent on plastic, politely but firmly showing it the door. Or maybe not so politely, given what it's done to us. Politeness might be overrated when you're discussing a global pollutant that's messing with fertility, digestion, and respiratory health. So, let's be direct. Plastic, we'd like you to pack up and leave, and take your microplastic spawn with you. Well said. We can always share more about other angles, like how these tiny plastic pieces also bond with heavy metals or how they can alter neurological function. But maybe that's a conversation for another episode. Yes, let's leave our listeners with enough existential dread to keep them busy. We don't want to overwhelm them by talking about microplastics crossing the blood-brain barrier. That'll be next time. We're never short on cheerful topics like that, are we? Until then, folks, remember you have power in your daily choices. Swap out plastic whenever you can, ditch single-use items, invest in glass or stainless steel, and choose clothing that doesn't shed microplastic confetti all over the planet. And if you're dealing with hormonal imbalances or suspiciously low energy, Maybe it's connected to all these synthetic estrogen imposters. Investigating progesterone could be a piece of your puzzle, especially in a thoroughly plastic-saturated world. Meanwhile, keep your sense of humor close, because sometimes laughter is the only rational response. Microplastics might be small, but our collective determination can be huge. That's our pep talk for the day. And what a pep talk it was. This has been Dr. Mercola Cellular Wisdom, the place where we calmly detail the minuscule threats to your well-being, while also dishing out comedic commentary you never asked for, but hopefully enjoy. I certainly hope so. If you can't poke a little fun at microplastics, well, they'll just poke at you. The conversation may not end here, but the show must. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Keep breathing carefully, keep learning, and we'll see you next time. Until next time, this is Ethan Foster signing off. May your cells stay plastic-free, and your coffee cups definitely not be lined with microplastics. And this is Alara Sky reminding you to question every convenience, especially when it comes in a plastic wrapper. Catch you all soon.